So they would refer to them as the initiates or the neophytes. In fact, when we watch the movie The Matrix, you know, that's where the name Neo comes from because he's the neophyte, right? So they would get induced into these in second chambers where they would get taught all of the secrets, all of the advanced uh, spiritual teachings that couldn't be taught to the masses. With me today is uh, Arcturus, who started astral projecting when he was a teenager. Thanks for coming on the show, Arcturus. It's good to have you here. Hey, Rod. Thank you for having me. I love talking to astral projectors and people that know about that, and I want to get into that, but can you tell me first what was your life like growing up before you had your first astral prediction experience? Yeah, so uh, basically when I was when I was a kid, I, I had a lot of interest on the paranormal, uh, you know, psychic abilities. And uh, I was always trying to to find some lectures about that, some some books that would talk about that. But uh, back then, we didn't have a lot of books that talked about that in Mexico. And then that's when the internet happened. And uh, luckily, I could speak English. So I started researching a lot of topics on the internet. and. Um, and over that time, I belonged to a, a very Catholic school in Mexico. And, you know, I, I was always asking questions and, and the teachers who were very much uh, priests, uh, they didn't have the answers. And they, would all, they were always saying that those were mysteries of God. And it wasn't until I started to experience the sleep paralysis um, probably around the time when I left the Catholic school, I, I think I was like 16 when I started to experience sleep paralysis. Um, at the beginning I was terrified, uh, because, you know, of the stuff they would tell me back at the Catholic school that, um, you know, I could, I could be getting possessed and all those, uh, films about the ex, ex the exorcist and all of those things were like popular in that Catholic school, I don't know why. And so um, it wasn't until a friend of mine suggested that sleep paralysis was connected to astral projection. And so that's when I started researching on, on the internet. Uh, I guess back then the internet was, in Spanish it didn't have a lot of information about anything metaphysical, but in the English speaking world, it had plenty of, of topics and since I could speak English, that's when I researched. And I, I did find out that sleep paralysis was connected to astral projection. In fact, they, they said it was like one of the, the phases uh, people go through sometimes when they uh, detach themselves from the physical body, right? So I learned that, and I also learned uh, techniques that involve the use of mantras. And mantras are these... Um, words of power that are, um, they appear in Indian literature. And so uh, the first time that I tried one of these mantras, I was able to consciously live my physical body. And I was very excited. Perhaps I had a, a little bit of fear. But as I continued exploring the astral dimension, that's when I lost all the fear and I started to find more answers. And the more I read about it too, uh, the more answers I got. And I got all of that, uh, all of those readings, I got them from this esoteric society. And I know that the word esoteric is becoming kind of like, it's, it's less popular nowadays, you know, but it's related to the occult, to the mystics. And it's becoming less popular these days because now uh, nothing is hidden anymore, right? So, but you know, um, yeah, that, and so that's how I began uh, astral projecting. That's how I learned astral projection. Okay. Now, I have not heard of the Esoteric Society before. Could you just tell us a bit more about that? Absolutely. That, that would be very interesting. What happened is that, you know, throughout the centuries, um, there's always been a lot of persecution uh, to other beliefs other belief systems. And at some point, um, those who were Christians were persecuted. Uh, but then, you know, the Christians became 
the, the ones that would persecute other groups. So basically, from the dawn of history, um, there were systems in place when it came to um, religious or spiritual teachings. There was what they refer to as the first chamber, which is basically the public mass. And that's, that's also why, I guess, you know, we call it mass because it's, it's, it's for the masses, you know. And then, then there was like the second chamber. And the second chamber was um, like this, this body of teachings that were reserved for people who were more spiritually involved. Uh, sorry, more spiritually evolved. So there were systems in place that ancient priests had to find out which person was more evolved spiritually, and then they would induce them um, into these second chambers um, or secret chambers. And those people would sometimes refer, uh, get the name of the initiates. So uh, they would refer to them as the initiates or the neophytes. In fact, when we um, watch the movie The Matrix, you know, that's where the name Neo comes from because he's the neophyte, right? So um, they would get induced into these in, into um, second chambers uh, where they would get taught, they, they would be taught um, all of the secrets, all of the advanced uh, spiritual teachings that couldn't be taught uh, to the masses. You know, even the Bible, there is a, a chapter in the Bible that says something like that, like, um, do not give pearls uh, to, the, to the swine or something like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, maybe that's like a, a little bit, I mean, sorry, that, that kind of sounds a little bit rough, right? But, you know, it pretty much means that not everybody is... Um, like ready to receive advanced uh, teachings because everybody has like a different, um, you know, um, level, a different uh, time of learning. Some people are learning certain things about life and some people have already learned what's necessary to um, get into more advanced uh, spiritual teachings, right? So um, those teachings had to do with the, what we call the, the awakening, right? So they would teach you how to awaken your consciousness, not just listening to, to mass or worshiping idols, but you know, to do the necessary practices, the necessary psychological work, and the necessary alchemical work, uh, because alchemy was a, a, it's a real thing, to help people awaken. And so, um, the, these these secret societies they always remain hidden. Um, I mean, back then in Egypt and and in Greece, people knew they existed and they respected them, but not everybody belonged to them. And then um, you know, throughout the centuries, they had to go um, incognito. They had to hide, and so they became actual secret societies. And sometimes they were called esoteric because. You know, the esoteric means like that, which is inside, inside of the person, right? So they, they were referred to as esoteric societies or mystical societies or cult societies. And, you know, the Freemasons were one of those um, esoteric societies. They were probably the most famous ones. Uh, but they were also the, the Rosicrucians, the Templars. And so basically... I joined one of those esoteric societies that started around the early 20th century. It was formed by European mystics who had studied the teachings from the East, from Buddhism, from Hinduism, and also the hidden teachings of Christianity. And they brought that to Europe, and then they brought that to Mexico. So these esoteric societies, they flourished in Mexico because it was, it was understood that there was an important energy vortex in Mexico, like a, an, an important spiritual vortex. You know, Mexico has always had the pyramids and uh, the teachings of the, of the Magians and the Aztecs. They had 
like strong spiritual views and the pyramids and the temples are connected. They are aligned to the temples in Egypt. So um, these, these masters from Europe, they came to, to Mexico because of that. And they survived as occult societies because, you know, uh, Mexico is a very uh, Catholic country and there was a lot of persecution back then. So by the time I joined the society, of course, there was no persecution anymore. And, you know, I prefer not to name the esoteric society that I joined because it could actually get me into trouble, you know, um, because, well, it's a long story. But it was in one of those esoteric societies that I was able to get a lot of teachings that were not even available in the English language. I mean, they, some of them, of them were, but I was able to like, get to the source of all, of all of that knowledge and put it into practice. And one of those knowledge that I learned had, uh, had to do with astral projection. And so I became really good at astral projecting because of these teachings. This is fascinating. So what's your understanding of what is actually happening during astral projection? Yeah, well, um, I used to think that my soul was leaving the physical body. And I think that's what most people think. But actually, the soul is a very complicated, a very complex um, concept. So what's living the body is not your soul. What's living your body is your consciousness, your awareness in a vehicle that is a body that is called the astral body because we are multidimensional beings. And so just as we have a physical body, we also have an etheric body, we have an astral body, we have a mental body, we have a causal body. We have many bodies of existence. And so the astral body is a vehicle that actually every night lifts the physical body. That means that everybody in this world, even also animals, they astral project at night. But the only difference, uh, I mean, what we called astral projection is to be aware of it. Because um, most of the people, when they astral project at, at night, they either dream or they don't remember anything, right? And so, um, but actually most people, they dream, even if, even if they remember it or not, or not. And they dream in their astral bodies. And so what happens is that your astral body, which is a very subtle, um, translucent, transparent body that cannot be seen by the physical eyes, leaves your physical body and gets into the fifth dimension right? We are in the three-dimensional world, but then there's the astral plane, which, is, which happens in the fifth dimension. And we have this subtle transparent body, which is the astral body that belongs to this fifth dimension. And it leaves the physical body every night, as I say, as I, as I mentioned. But uh, most people don't perceive the, the fifth dimension. They don't perceive the astral plane because their consciousness is busy in their subjective world, the world of dreams, which, which gets projected into the astral plane, into the fifth dimension. So astral projection or lucid dreaming consists on techniques to make you aware that you are in the fifth dimension and no longer in the dream. And so there are many ways to achieve this. And one of the, of the main ways is the direct transition, which happens when you are, when you are falling asleep. Um, you become aware of the moment in which your astral body lifts your physical body and you're conscious about it. And so that's like a very good way to experience the pure astral experience. And the other way would be through lucid dreaming, which is when you realize that you are dreaming. And so... You, you train to realize I'm dreaming and then you concentrate, you focus, you know that you're in the astral world and then the dream images start to disappear and then you start seeing the, the pure astral plane. So those are the, the, the main two ways in which uh, we can explore the astral reality. And like I said, it happens in this vehicle that is the astral uh, body 
and it's a body that leaves the physical body every night and it's perfectly safe and people sometimes they worry that they they will never come back to their physical body and they will die and to those people i tell you to be honest it's hard to remain consciously in the astral plane i mean i only met a person recently that had that issue i mean her problem was that she could easily astral project and she had a hard time going back to her physical body and i told that woman you know i wish i had your your problem you know because the things that you can do in the astral plane they it's just a superior plane of existence the, the limit the it's there are it, it the possibilities are endless i found it's to go from a, a dream to a lucid dream has been i've had more success there but the 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 catch was well not not the catch but was just remembering that you're dreaming. So it's, it almost seemed to be, it's almost like it's random for me. Even if I go to sleep with an intention of, okay, I'm going to um, wake up during during my dream or, or move to a lucid state or some sort of mantra, I'll obviously have to get some more training. Then it, it was almost random as to when it would occur. But it's such, oh. a, it's such a revelation when you realize, oh, I'm dreaming. Like when you actually get that, oh, I'm dreaming. Then, then it kind of everything changes. After that, and you go into a fully conscious state, it's it, it is a pretty exciting thing. Well, at least it is for me anyway, because I'm still fairly new to it. Yeah, you, it's you, fascinating when when you achieve that. Now, you mentioned mantra early on, and was did you use the mantra uh, to help you achieve an out of body state, like from just as you were falling asleep, or was it some other time? Yeah, actually, um, the I use them when I'm falling asleep, when I'm on my bed, laying on my back. That's very important. Um, that the real position to astral project is to lay on your back. And uh, the it, it's very interesting because the first time that I tried it, something completely different happened that never happened again. And basically, um, I was doing the mantra and I started feeling vibrations in my body. This actually happens very often. But the thing that never happened again was that I actually fell into a dream, right? So most of the time, um, when you fall into a dream, you could say that the experiment uh, to astral project has failed. But this was the, the very first time that I tried this. And so um, I basically dreamed, I dreamt that I, um, that I was a kid and I saw my brother. And my brother was playing with this uh, weird toy that looked like a staff. And... And, and and he came and he gave me the staff and I was like, what's that? And I, I held it and then I started like shaking like as if I was a rocket taking off. And at that moment, I, I just opened my eyes and I was outside of my physical body just floating in my room. I didn't see, you know, the, the shape of my astral body. I was like a consciousness, like a vision just floating uh, on top of, you know, close to the ceiling. And I saw my my physical body just laying there uh, below, below, and he was sleeping there. And I was like, oh, my God, I did it. And then I remember that I, for some reason, tried to get out of my room. And I, I reached for the window, and I felt the, the glass, and I felt the cold from outside. And I felt the, you know, the, the surface of the glass. And the moment I touched it, I just came back to my physical body and woke up but I immediately knew that I had achieved it. And so it's very interesting that that was the way that the first experience happened. It never happened again. I was never given a staff or anything like that. But it's, it's, it's as if, you know, I received an initiation or something like that from my, I don't know why my brother was the one who gave me the staff, but, uh, you know, I, from that moment on, I never had a dream like that that would help me to astral project. But I would um, astral project directly by doing the mantra, the mantras, when falling asleep. And at the beginning, I could astral project every single day, every single night. I was astral projecting. Wow! And when you say in the beginning you were astral projecting every day, is is it a daily practice for you still, or is it less often? Yes and no. What happened is that I guess I became a little bit spoiled because of so much astral travel, like there were times where I was just like flying around neighborhoods and I guess I was, you know, I, I didn't know many of the secrets that I learned 
um, later on when I actually joined the esoteric society I was talking about. And some of those secrets had to do about, uh, with how to um, transport yourself to um, teleport yourself to different places or how to travel back in time and to the future or how to access the Akashic Records. I learned that later on when I joined the Esoteric Society. And by the time I joined the Esoteric Society, it's, it's as if my, my ability to astral project started to, to, to become you know, uh, less successful. And back then, I talked to my spiritual guide about that, and he said that I was basically given this skill at the beginning to motivate me to um, get into spirituality. But now I had to do like a big effort to, um, uh, to astral project because I, I needed to actually work for it. And so I can tell you that if I really want to astral project, I could astral project every night. But it involves more effort from my part. And when you combine that with the working life, then I guess it's a bit hard. Because, for instance, yesterday I just came, came back from a... a a trip to the beach. Uh, I mean, I camped for one night. I, I was really tired. And so the only thing I was thinking about was to get some sleep, right? I didn't have time to, uh, to do my practice. Mm. Yes. You just mentioned the Akashic Records, and uh, that's another fascinating topic for me. So can you just explain to people what the Akashic Records are and, and uh, what made you access those in the first place? Yeah, so, so basically what happened is that I always had this urge to, um, to find out about the past, about the hidden history of mankind. I was always obsessed with the idea of Atlantis. Uh, the very first time I, I read about it, I heard about the existence of Atlantis, right? I just found all of that fascinating. And so um, through the teachings, through the esoteric teachings that I received, I found out that there were ways to um, visit history, to, to you know, see history in the astral world. And that was through uh, something called the Akashic Records. And so basically the Akashic Records refer to a sort of library. I mean, it, it, it appears as a library that can be visited in the astral world which holds all of the records, all of the, the memories of the history of every action, of every object, of every person, of every event that has ever happened in the world. And so, um, so when I found out about that, then that became my, my goal, to be able to visit this place, the Akashic Records in the astral world, um, to be able to see with my own eyes about the history, the hidden history of humanity and all of the secrets. I wanted to see everything. And so that's how I began to, um, to use astral projection to access the Akashic Records because you can also access the Akashic Records at any time. You don't have to astral project to do that. And I do, I, I access the Akashic Records without astral projecting. But it, 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 um, you know, it's, it's better when you can astral project there because you can see it very clearly with your astral body. You can travel um, back in time. You can, you can be in places and see them at full color, even, even more colorful than, than this reality because you see everything with auras and things like that. Um, and like I said, you can also access them without astral traveling. And I do do that often. But in my case, I get like thoughts and intuitions. Sometimes these, these thoughts are like a bit more colorful. And then, you know, stuff happens that I, I get a confirmation uh, through events that, then later, that happen later. Or I meet someone who's a very advanced clairvoyant. I could say that I, I also, I have some clairvoyance, but uh, it's not, you know, it's probably uh, increasing. But I know people who can see better uh, things with their clairvoyant eyes, and I can get confirmation about many things that I saw, you know? Uh, but like I said, it's, it's uh, way better, in my opinion, to visit the Akashic Records with your astral body consciously. Okay. 
And when you're astral projecting, do you ever encounter any like guides or other entities on a, on a regular basis that you recognize? Yeah. Yeah. Actually I've, I have encountered gods. I have encountered masters and I have encountered, um, other people, other astral projectors. Uh, most of them are not conscious that they are in the astral world. They are actually seeing, uh, their, their dream images. I have um, encountered astral people who astral project consciously and that I later met in the physical world. And uh, so I met them there in the astral world before I met them in this three-dimensional world, right? And I have also uh, met extraterrestrials. And, and it's funny because uh, the last encounter that I had with extraterrestrials was about three weeks ago. Uh, that was the latest um, experience, and it was just fascinating because it, it you know, people started talking about uh, this 2024 seems to have a lot of um, relation with with extraterrestrials. The way I found out was because people were you know talking a lot about uh, encounters with extraterrestrials or how. The Arcturians are helping mankind, or how uh, other extraterrestrial races are um, helping us. And so I started feeling like, I don't know, I just have the feeling that sooner or later I'm going to have uh, another alien encounter. Because I've had alien encounters before, but it was a long time ago. And, you know, I have friends who say they, they talk to extraterrestrials all, all of the time. And, and I, I was just wondering why. It wasn't happened to me very often, but I was definitely interested on, on, on having those experiences. And so one night, I, um, I woke up in the middle of the night to um, meditate for 20, 30 minutes, which is something I normally do. I meditate in the middle of the night, and then I go back to, to bed, and I do my practices to astral protect. Um, and so that, that makes it easy when you wake up in the middle of the night and, and meditate. It makes it easier to ask or project. And so while I was meditating at the end of my meditation, I just thought about this thing that I just mentioned about extraterrestrials. I was like, why haven't I, you know, talked to them, um, you know, in all of these years? Uh, why I don't have extraterrestrials encounters very often in the astral plane? You know, I wonder. And so what happened was that then, I went back to bed. I astral projected. Well, actually, I didn't astral project. I fell into a dream, and then I realized that I was dreaming, so I became lucid. And so I was like, okay, I know I'm lucid. And I, I sat down in, my, in the astral world, in the dream world, and I started to meditate again, you know, so that the dream images would disappear, and I would see the purity of the astral world. And then I, I, I called for a master to help me, he was a master that, that I've seen in the astral before and is helping mankind a lot. His name is Yogananda. I don't know if you heard about him, but um, he's, a, he's assisting um, yes, mankind. Yep. Um, he's very active these days. And so I call, and I had an experience with him like a few days ago. So I call for him again. And instead, <laughs> I was, uh, I suddenly, see this being like very tall being maybe like um 10 feet tall and he was like he was dressed as you know like this asian kind of master like a kung fu master i, I that's the way i could i could describe the the clothing and he had long white hair completely white and he they, and and this master had these eyes that, you know, the, the iris was like very light blue to the point of almost being white. And it seemed to like shine or something like that. And the moment I saw that, I was like, oh, wow. I, I was expecting Yogananda and I saw this uh, and this being and I was like, I instantly knew he was an extraterrestrial because um, you also get a lot of intuition in the astral world and you also com communicate telepathically. And so this being was just looking down at me and smiling. And I was like, oh, you're, you're a master from space or something like that. 
and he told me, oh, wow, you're speaking in Spanish. And I was like, well, you're speaking in Spanish too. And it, it just seemed funny. It was like as if he was uh, using sense of humor because sense of humor has a very high vibration, you know, like, mm. you know, a master that presents itself from another planet would probably want to use this sense of humor and, you know, to connect, to bond and to raise both vibrations, right? And and it, and it was funny in a way because I knew that in the astral world, it doesn't matter what language you speak because you instantly get it uh, translated to your mother tongue. It's, it's telepathy. That's the way of to communicate in the astral naturally. You can communicate with people. I have communicated with people from any part of the world that speak other languages and and you you listen to it in your mother tongue or I sometimes listen to it in Sp in English too because I'm you know I can speak very advanced English and sometimes it's okay for me and so and those are the languages that I understand uh, in the astral right but they can be speaking Chinese they can be speaking extraterrestrial and I can understand and so and so I follow this master and and. And then I saw this this other extraterrestrial, which was wearing this sort of like Hawaiian um, t-shirt or shirt, and, I, and that was also funny. It was like he looked at me and he was like, you know, like funny. But they were they were definitely extraterrestrials, and they were ten feet tall, very lean, um, very slender. Well, not very slender. I mean, they they had like good bodies, but just like very tall, right? And um, and the, the hair, the hair was like this white, long hair. And so I suddenly lost this, this master. And I was like, where is he? Where is he? And I was like looking for him in the astral world. And I didn't find him again. And then I woke up and it was okay. I think it was like a, like a touch base, you know, like a, a presentation. It was like good for the first um, meetup. And so that moment, I was very excited, and I messaged my my girlfriend, and she's also like a, a very spiritual person with a lot of skills. And the moment I told her what she what I saw, she said um, that she believed those were Lyrians or Lyrians. I don't know how yep. you uh, pronounce them. And and she sent me these images uh, about Lyrians, and what I saw was exactly what I saw in the astral, like the. You know, they had some some sort of like catsy kind of look, but they were they were still very human. Like, I mean, they didn't look like cats; they looked more like humans. But they were kind of like catsy. They had sort of like catsy, like high um, cheekbones or something like that, and and they had like pointy kind. Yeah, they had pointy ears, like elves. And she explained to me that these Lyrans they also exist in the elfic world. And in, in the hollow earth, in the elfic worlds, uh, or they sort of helped to create these elfic worlds. Uh, but it was fascinating. And, and after that, I, ha I started having more experiences with these uh, Lyrans. But that was more personal. To the point that I actually believe that I, they, they reached out to me because uh, I believe I was also a Lyran in a past life. And... This is the concept of the star seeds, which is something that my girlfriend probably understands better than me. But what I understand is basically that a lot of souls in this planet, uh, they have had their evolution in other planets. And then they came here to help mankind long time ago, like probably millions of years ago or thousands of years ago. And they mix with earthlings. Uh, they mix with the habitants of this world. Uh, with the humanities of this world in order to help us evolve. Um, and it was like a sacrifice for them because, you know, they had already evolved in their worlds and this, this world was less evolved. The people were less evolved. And of course, that it's a world where there is still a lot of suffering going on in this world. And so they took that, that sacrifice. And my understanding is that uh, a lot of extraterrestrials are in this situation and they are willing to do this because of love, you know, love is a universal law. And when a being becomes uh, awakened, when a being becomes evolved, then that being feels uh, the need to help other beings in other planets to evolve and to awaken. Because in the end, we're all part of this uh, one being, you know, that we might call 
God, we might call the universe, it's, it's like this uh, cosmic force that it's the unity. And we are all part of that unity, even though we at this point only perceive the separation or the duality, but the concept is that one day we'll be able to go back to this unity. And so, yep, that's the understanding that I got from that, uh, just from meeting them in the astral world, you know, one thing led to another. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I like the part where you were saying that uh, you were wondering why was it that you hadn't actually, you know, seen any extraterrestrials for a while. And I think this speaks to that fundamental question about why is it that they're not just showing up at, on the White House lawn and saying, hey, here we are. And the answer I got to that was just something I was just reading last night is that there has to be a calling first. So you at that point when you said why, that was like the calling. That was like, okay, well, I want to actually meet up. And then that's when they appeared, but not before then. Notice the difference. Yeah, I, I met them before that, but uh, it wasn't on, my, you know, it was thanks to the intervention of my, of my um, spiritual guide in the, mm. the three-dimensional world. But I didn't meet them in the astral. I actually met them um, in a meditation. And I met them physically. Like they were like, you know, probably... Uh, 20 feet from where I was uh, in this three-dimensional world. And, you know, I had my eyes like this, so I could barely see them. And then they would disappear because they have that ability to uh, to change their frequency. And the moment they change the frequency, you can't see them again in your with your physical eyes, you know. They they, they are experts at uh, changing their frequency. So, um, yeah, like, like, you, like you said, the invitation is part of it because the moment you invite them, you also level up a little bit with their with their frequency, you know. It's like a, sort of like law of at, of attraction kind of works like that. So that's one of the of the first requirements, and the other requirement is that um, they basically need to lower their vibration to interact with us, and lowering their vibration is not like very nice, and so. Um, they sort of uh, want us to raise our vibration and they are helping us to raise our vibration so that we can interact with them and we can see them. But they also, they also respect a lot uh, the, cause, the, the karmic laws. So if they just you know, show up to the world and start tearing down the system, then um, they would maybe be violating some laws related to free will. And so also we need to like walk our own path. But it is my belief that also there are other beings uh, or other entities that might be, might be violating these, these laws and they, they don't have good intentions. And maybe that's why these good extraterrestrials are going to start showing up more often so that they, they kind of like balance the situation. These beings that are visiting us, um, these, um, these extraterrestrials that can be perceived in the astral world or that can sometimes manifest in the three-dimensional world, they belong to this field of vibration that can actually reach us, right? Because in the universe, there might be beings that are, that are more advanced even, that have even higher vibrations. And that can't even reach us. You know, they can't even lower, they can't lower their vibration low enough to reach us. Uh, like right now, as I said, as I said, Arcturians are another race of things that are, you know, people are talking about a lot these days because they are actually becoming more active and they are basically in the limit. Like the, they, they might not even have physical bodies. They are like in the limit of, um, of, what, of reaching us like they you know they need to low they, they you need to raise your vibration a lot and you can probably encounter them in the astral but it might be harder to actually contact them in the three-dimensional world i don't i don't even know if they can contact us in the three-dimensional world because they belong to even higher you know dimensions and like i said there are angelical beings that can't even like reach us and just the same way there might be in the universe, and I'm sure um, and that there are also beings that have such low vibration, that you could say they are evil, but their vibration is also so low that they can't raise their vibration 
um, enough to actually perceive us too. So it goes both ways. Mm. As you've been astral projecting, what's the important things that have helped you with your own spiritual development along the way? Yeah, so basically when I discovered astral projection, I discovered that I was not limited to this physical world and you know, religions or the church that I, you know, I, I was raised a Catholic and they didn't have the answers. And I was always wondering, like, what's the other world like and what happens after we die and all of those mysteries. And the astral revealed those mysteries to me because actually the astral world, it's a, it's a very big place. Um, so it's a place that we go when we are dreaming, even though we, uh, if we're dreaming, we, we see the subconscious images. It's a place that we perceive when we are astral projecting consciously. And it's also the place where um, the dead uh, normally go to. The, the, the people that die, they go to the astral plane. They have their own special place, their own special field or worlds in the astral plane. So they are not always visible to people who are astral projecting. But they they exist. They go to the astral plane, and they wait there until they are born again in the three dimensional world. But you could say that the astral world is like some sort of heaven, because it's a higher dimension, and there are less laws. And the less laws there are, the more happiness there is. Right? Um, the the more laws there are, the the more unhappiness. And in this three-dimensional world, we have 48 laws, whereas in the astral world, um, there are 24 laws. So it's half the laws that we have in this uh, three-dimensional world. And so some of those laws can be like gravity. So there is no gravity in the astral, so you can fly. Uh, another, wor another law from the three-dimensional world would be the need to, uh, to eat, you know, eat food, eat animals, eat plants uh, to survive, eat, drink water. In the astral world, you don't have that. So, of course, you don't have to go to work. <laughs> you don't have to pay rent. Uh, so it's a paradise. But technically, it's, it's not heaven. Because um, in order to go to heaven, um, you need to awaken in the physical world, in this three-dimensional world, you, you need to completely awaken so that you don't have to reincarnate. You don't have to, um, you know, you have to exit the wheel of samsara. So in this concept, um, you know, they say that in Tibet, people cry when a baby is born because pe people say, well, this baby came to this world to suffer because this, this is the world where there is suffering. And that they actually celebrate when a person passes, because it's like, oh, that person is going to have some vacations, right? It's going to go to the world of the death, and it's going to have some vacations there. And so the, the whole concept of that I, you know, I learned from my studies in spirituality is that um, we need to raise our vibration so that we can awaken. And once we awaken, we exit the wheel of samsara the wheel of eternal return to this world. And we start exploring the sixth and the seventh dimensions, which are dimensions above the astral plane, above the fifth dimension. And those are the actual paradises um, where energy and then something that is not even energy exists and form doesn't exist. And, you know, there are even less laws. So, the happiness is undescribable. And so I think that's the point of, uh, that's how we achieve this, this oneness. And this is what I've learned uh, through my experiences and through my teachings. I mean, sorry, not my, teaching, my teachings, but uh, the teachings that I have studied. Actors, people are going to want to ask you questions. Oh, I know I've got these more. We could go on forever. So could you tell us, just tell us everything you've got going on. I know you've written a few books and tell us about whatever other programs, how people can get in touch with you if they want to. Yeah, so I've, I've written three books on astral projection. I'm actually writing a novel uh, now that uh, talks about, you know, these mysteries of the earth, about these uh, previous humanities such as Atlantis. Um, it's a novel, but it's based 
on on the teachings that I have received and also my experiences um, getting information from the Akashic Records. And um, and I have uh, also recently had a retreat here in Mexico in a temple that I'm 100% sure that it's an Atlantean temple, you know, it's an Atlantean temple in the Mexican jungle that I have been able to explore. It's, you know, there's a physical part of the temple in the three-dimensional world, but there are also, there's also the astral part that, you, that I have explored and I have learned that it's a, it's a temple from, from Atlantis, you know. And so we recently had a retreat over there where we activated some important codes for, for humanity. It was like our contribution um, to humanity to help to raise the vibration. And I'm going to have another retreat soon with my partner in Spain. And this is, uh, we are still planning, but planning it, but it might happen this summer. And I also have my astral projection course for those interested on in learning how to uh, astral project because, you know, I, I tell you that, well, and you know, through the, your astral experiences that astral projection can change your life. And it's, it's something incredible to experience. So I have an online course and people can find out more on my website at um, escapefromthematrix.com. Okay, great. Have you got any final message that you want to leave with people before we wrap up today? Yeah, so I just want to tell people that um, I want to encourage them to explore other realities. I want them to know that astral projection is 100% safe. That it's something that you do every night. It's natural. Um, but most people are just not aware of it. And by studying the techniques to astral project, you can be aware of it and you can explore the astral reality. And that can awaken a lot of uh, different uh, skills, you know, uh, that's how I started becoming interested in spirituality, in um, learning more about the truth, about myself, about the world, about, spirit, about religion, and about the mysteries of the world. And as a projection opened those doors for me. And so I want to invite everyone to study as a projection. And like I said, my course is available online. And I'm also assisting people on a, on a WhatsApp group. And if you, if you um, join my course, you have access to that um, a WhatsApp chat where I can answer all of your questions. And yeah, that's, that's what I want to say. Okay. This has been a, a fascinating conversation, Arturo. So I really appreciate you being my guest today. Yeah. So thank you very much, Rod. And I had a wonderful time.